what is your favorite number? If you're a Douglas Adams fan, you might have said 42. If you're feeling a little edgy, you might have said 69. If you're a math nerd like me, you might have said pi or e. But chances are you said 7. Even if you didn't, you probably picked an integer less than 10. You seem to have a soft spot for small numbers, which makes sense. You run into them all the time and build little emotional attachments. But here's something strange. 10 isn't nearly as popular as 9 or 11. Why? I'd argue it's because 10 is the first two-digit number. It feels like crossing a boundary. But that boundary isn't mathematical, it's linguistic. The sequence 1, 0 isn't a number. It's a symbol representing a quantity. The fact that it feels bigger, rounder, or more important than 9 has nothing to do with math itself. It's just a side effect of the system we use to write numbers. That system is called base 10. And if we changed it, all our familiar numbers would suddenly look completely different. And maybe 10 would be better liked. But hold on. What are you even saying when we write something like 1, 0? We take the way we write numbers for granted, but there's some sneaky math happening behind the scenes. Every time you write a number, you're really writing a polynomial in disguise, each digit multiplied by a power of the base. In base 10, when we write something like 163, what we're really saying is we want 1 100, 6 10s, and 3 1s. In other words, those digits, 1 6 3, represent 1 times 10 squared, plus 6 times 10 to the first, plus 3 times 10 to the zero. So each digit represents how many of a particular power of 10 we want. Similarly, we can go the other direction and add values to the right of the decimal place, or more generally, the radix point. This just asks how many of a particular negative power of 10 we want. For example, 23.58 is just 2 times 10 to the first, plus 3 times 10 to the zero, plus 5 times 10 to the negative first, plus 8 times 10 to the negative 2. There's nothing sacred about the number 10 here, it's just the base we've all agreed to use. And that agreement probably comes down less to mathematics and more to biology. After all, 10 fingers makes base 10 feel natural. But we could just as easily count in base 16, and suddenly 1, 0 wouldn't mean 10 at all. In base 16, each place represents a power of 16 instead of 10. So 1, 0 in base 16 really means 1 times 16 to the first plus 0 times 16 to the 0, which is just 16 in base 10. Likewise, the digits 1, 6, 3 in base 16 would mean 1 times 16 squared, plus 6 times 16 to the first, plus 3 times 16 to the zero, or 355 in base 10. Same digits, completely different value. In base 10, we have 10 symbols, 0 through 9, to tell us how many of each power of 10 we want. But in base 16, we need more symbols, 16 to be precise. After 9, we run out of single digit numbers, so we borrow some letters. That's why base 16, also called hexadecimal, uses A, B, C, D, E, and F to stand for 10 through 15. So A means 10, B means 11, and so on. That makes D7 a perfectly normal hexadecimal number, 13 times 16 to the first, plus 7 times 16 to the zero, or 215 in base 10. What makes base 10 more natural than base 16? For us, base 10 feels intuitive. We've got 10 fingers, so we learn to group things by tens. But what's natural to us isn't universal. A base feels natural when it fits the structure of the world you're counting in. In a world where everyone was born with 16 fingers, base 16 would make just as much sense as base 10 does to us. But natural can also mean convenient. For the ancient Sumerians, base 60 was perfectly natural. Not because of biology, but because of arithmetic. 60 divides evenly by so many smaller numbers that fractions were neat and exact. If you were a merchant cutting up a pie or a priest tracking the stars, base 60 made arithmetic smoother. And the consequences of that choice are still with us thousands of years later. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 360 degrees in a circle. For a computer though, natural means something entirely different. Computers don't have fingers, they have circuits. Each transistor is like a tiny switch indicating one of two states, either on or off, true or false. So the most natural base for them is two, one for on, zero for off. From the simplest possible base, every pixel, sound, and program is built. But if base 2 is so simple and so powerful, why don't we use base 2 for everything? As I said, natural can mean convenient. Most people don't interact with numbers much larger than a few thousand in their day-to-day -day life. In base 10, even a number as large as 9,999 can be represented in just four symbols, nice and compact. But that same number in binary takes 14 digits to write out. Could you imagine having to write out 14 digits every time you wanted to pay your rent? 
whatever base we use, it needs to strike a balance between convenience and intuition. And for most modern people, base 10 strikes that perfect balance. But here's where things get weird. There's no rule that says our base has to be a whole number. A base is just the ratio between place values. That ratio could be 10 or 2 or 60 or even something like pi. As long as we're consistent, the math still works. One of the most elegant is base phi, the golden base. Here, the base isn't an integer at all, but the golden ratio, about 1.618, the same number that shows up in spirals, flowers, and nautilus shells. In some sense, the golden base might seem like the most natural base in which to represent whole numbers. The golden ratio has the interesting property that phi squared equals phi plus one. In fact, this is often how the golden ratio is defined. Thanks to this fact, we can count up by one simply by multiplying our previous number by phi. But how do we even write a number in base phi? What will our digits even look like? When we used base 10, there were 10 distinct symbols, namely the familiar numbers 0 through 9. Similarly, with base 16, we had 16 unique symbols, 0 through 9 along with a through f. Is it possible to have phi many symbols? In this case, we can restrict our symbols to just 0 and 1 and still end up with a surprisingly powerful representation. For example, 3 in base phi can be written as 100.01. Similarly, 4 is 101.01, and 5 is 1000.1001. It turns out it's possible to write any integer in base phi using only finitely many ones and zeros for our digits. Even though we're working in an irrational base, everything stays consistent. Our arithmetic still follows the same rules, just in a different rhythm. Speaking of rhythm, non-integer bases aren't just a mathematical curiosity. They actually show up in the real world. Take music, for example. There are 12 unique notes in Western music, repeating in cycles called octaves. When we move up by one octave, the pitch doubles. Middle C, for instance, vibrates at about 261.6 Hz. The C an octave above it, called C5, vibrates at 523.2 Hz, exactly twice as fast. But an octave isn't a single leap. It's divided into 12 equal steps called semitones. To make those steps equal, each one has to multiply the frequency by the same constant the 12th root of 2, about 1.059. So every time you move up one key on a piano, you multiply the frequency by 1.059. And after 12 of these multiplications, you've doubled your frequency and reached the next octave. In a sense, musical pitch lives in base 2 to the 1 12th. We can think of middle C as our 1, and each step upward or downward as shifting one place in this base. Chords then become like multi-digit numbers, combinations of notes that add together to form something richer. For example, we could play the number 10001.01. The far left one represents the note A, the middle one the note C, and the far right one the note E. Combined together, we get an A minor chord. But we can go even further. Just as a single number can represent a chord, a sequence of numbers can represent an entire chord progression, a musical sentence of sorts. For example, the cycle 145, the classic chord progression behind most pop songs, could be written as a repeating pattern in a musical bass. Shifting that pattern up or down a place value transposes it into a new key, exactly the way multiplying by the base shifts magnitude in ordinary arithmetic. In this way, a piece of music becomes a kind of number sequence, and changing the base changes the way we perceive its nature. Now, let's take a short break from pure math and do a little arts and crafts. Seriously, grab a strip of paper. The longer and thinner, the better. Fold it in half, then fold it in half again, and again, and again, as many times as you can while still keeping crisp creases. Once you've done that, carefully unfold it. You'll see a jagged pattern of peaks and valleys twisting back and forth in what looks like random chaos. But here's where it gets interesting. For each crease, fold it so the paper bends 90 degrees in the natural direction of that crease. Up if it was up, down if it was down. It takes a little patience, but when you're done, something amazing happens. Your paper takes on a distinct, almost dragon-like shape. You've just built a fractal. As you keep folding, the pattern grows in complexity, Endlessly self-similar, curling tighter and tighter. The mathematical limit, this shape becomes the Hayway Dragon Curve. And this fractal isn't just a pretty accident. It's tied to my favorite number base, which I like to call the paper folding base. This is a number system that uses a complex number as its base, specifically 1 plus i, with very particular rules about which digits can appear in each position. Each number can only use digits from 1, i, negative 1, negative i, and 0. Which is already odd, but wait, there's more. If we look at all of the non-zero digits of the number, they must appear in the order determined by a clockwise rotation by 90 degrees around the unit circle. 
So this means the number negative i, negative 1, 0, i, 1 is valid, but the number negative i, i, negative 1, negative i is not. It turns out each Gaussian integer, that is, complex numbers with a whole number real and imaginary part, could be written in this funky base. For example, the number 3 plus 3i can be written as 1 times 1 plus i squared, minus i times 1 plus i to the first, minus 1 times 1 plus i to the zero. In fact, each Gaussian integer has exactly four representations, one starting with a 1, one starting with an i, one starting with a negative 1, and one starting with negative i. But what does this have to do with the paper folding fractal we just made? It turns out if you take the same base and consider all numbers you can generate with the same rules, but with numbers to the right of the radix point, we actually generate four copies of our paper folding fractal, infinitely close together but never touching. So the paper you just folded isn't random at all, it's literally a picture of a number system. And that's what I find beautiful about this. When you fold the paper, you're doing math with your hands. Every crease direction matches a rule in base 1 plus i, and when you unfold it, you're seeing the geometry that arithmetic creates. That's what's so strange and wonderful about math. If you change the rules for how numbers work, you change the shape that math takes, and sometimes you can end up with some really beautiful results. And that's what I love about number bases. They start as a way to organize counting, but the further you explore, the more they turn into a way of seeing math differently. Each base is its own little lens, a way to notice patterns you'd miss in any other system. All a base really does is decide how we group things, how we bundle quantities into symbols that make sense to us. We picked base 10 because it fits our hands. The Sumerians picked base 60 because it fit their fractions. Computers use base 2 because it fits the way electrons behave. None of these systems change the math itself, they just change the shape. And that's the point. Aces aren't about what's natural or correct, they're about what's useful for the moment, what makes patterns visible. Once you realize that, it's hard not to appreciate the number 10 a little more. Thanks for watching. I haven't been making videos for very long, but this is by far my favorite topic I've covered. I hope you've enjoyed the journey as much as I did. If you did, feel free to subscribe for more. Till next time.